Columbus Voters Speak, no ward system for city council. From the Battelle studio at WOSU at Coastside, this is Columbus on the Record. Joining guest host Ann Fisher this week, Kathy Kandiski, State House reporter for the Columbus Dispatch. Andy Chow, State House reporter for Ohio Public Radio. Terry Casey, Republican strategist, and Derek Clay, Democratic strategist. Fewer than one out of every 10 eligible Columbus voters decided this week against a proposal to change the structure and expand city council. But they spoke loud and clear, trouncing issue one with more than 71% of the vote. Still, in July, Mayor Andrew Ginther said he would form a charter review commission to evaluate that and other ways to modernize city government. Terry Casey, this is the third time in 50 years that Columbus voters have rejected a ward style system for city council. Now the mayor has promised this new commission review. Uh, does the issue go away now? I don't think it goes away because the mayor said he was going to look at it. People like Greg Lashutka, former mayor, his view was some ward council members might be good, but the balance of 10 by ward and only three at large. So I think it's going to continue to go on because it is impressive that of the 25 largest cities in America, we're the only one that doesn't have some type of ward. So I think something's going to happen, but the question is when and in what form is it? Well. People of Columbus have spoken, right? And this wasn't just a simple no vote on issue one. This was a resounding go sit down in the corner and don't bring me that nonsense no. I mean, 72% of the voters said no. So, you know, the, the voters in the city of Columbus are very smart. They're very in tune with their government. They know that this administration, they know that the city council has their best interests. And not only that, the city council members that are representing city council now are diverse amongst the city. You have a city council member that's on the south side. You have a city council member that is uh, in, the, in the Clintonville area. Uh, <clears throat> so you have a number of people that are on city council that are very diverse in their, where they live. But Derek, give credit, and on the show here, Ann was on it July 15th, I said this issue is going down, but when you spend 1.2 million, and it's easier with a no vote, and then when you fib a little bit on the council salary being 80,000, or it's gonna be 25 members, uh, I don't think everything's perfect at City Hall, but, the corporate interests in City Hall got their $1.2 million worth. Yeah, but the folks on the yes side had about $300,000 as well that came in from Trump and some of the Koch brothers the as well. The Trump, that was all Trump money, huh? Regardless of the spending, <laughs> I mean, this was pretty much a thumping. It'll probably be discussed again, as you mentioned, by the, the, is it the Charter Review Commission. But the question is, are they gonna be able to come back with some kind of recommendation that then they can put back before voters or before council this quickly after this defeat. I think that's gonna to be tough. This map illustrates the extensive opposition to issue one across the city. 95% of the precincts opposed it. The few clusters of support were scattered across the city from the university district to the hilltop. Derek Clay, so what does that suggest though? I mean, for one thing, just less than one out of every 10 voters, fewer than one out of every 10 voters turned out. And then there, the opposition or the support for it was scattered across the city, not clustered as much as you might have thought. Sure, well, it was scattered. Um, some of the areas that, that um, had the highest turnout was north of the university. Um, but again, you know, 72% of the voters said that they did not want this. Um, and I know that it was low voter turnout because of the special election, but if it was such an important issue to the voters of Columbus, the voters would have, would have come out and they would have voted yes for this issue. Well, I think it was dumb, that, and I told some of the people they shouldn't have put it on in August because with that low of a turnout, it made it easier for City Hall to spend their million dollars plus confuse voters and get a no vote. So I think it better turn out more people would have thought more about it. I think when you look back at the, the results of all of this too, it just goes to show you just how powerful the sitting Democratic Party is in the city of Columbus because if, if, if they want something to go a certain way, I mean, they've, they've had elections go their way they've, for, for re-elections, for current sitting people, and now for these issues too. It's just, they're very powerful in the city. Except on some ballot issues, the last two on the zoo and the Columbus School levy, both those got about 70% against. So money and City Hall and the corporate connections don't always guarantee victory.
Where do Republicans go from here, though? I mean, uh, where, where, where do they, they take do? this defeat? I mean, how do they turn this defeat Well, around? it really wasn't just a Republican issue. Jonathan Beard, who's been very active in the East Side, I think was probably the the main mover and pusher on it, and he's not a Republican, so. But the county party supported it, and the Democratic county party opposed it. Well, and it I got a phone, phone call from somebody with a South End twang saying, uh, vote no on it, because the socialist and the Green Party's pushing it. So there were all kind of things and messages <laughs> going on. Okay, everything is just fine with Republican Donald Trump's presidential campaign, at least according to Trump. Even as angst spreads across the Republican universe, their nominee for president at a Florida rally this week insisted all is well in the Trump camp. I just want to tell you the campaign is doing really well. It's never been so well united. We started on June 16th. I would say right now it's the best in terms of being united that it's been since we began. We're doing incredibly well. We're leading in the state of Florida. You saw the poll. We're leading in Ohio. We're about tied in Pennsylvania, but I think we're going to be leading the next time. So I think, we, I think we've never been this united, and I just want to thank everybody for being here. This is incredible. Okay, so much to talk about. Andy Chow, there are rumors that Trump may drop out before Election Day. This week he complained about a rigged election. He, he threatened not to endorse uh, Speaker of the House Paul Ryan uh, in his uh, upcoming um, uh, primary election uh, is everything really fine now he since has since said that he will probably or his campaign said that he will probably endorse Ryan be that as it may is everything really fine really I, great I guess it depends on who you ask if you ask Donald Trump in his mind I think he thinks that everything's all hunky-dory but if you really look at just every time he says something controversial every time he says something that rubs people the wrong way there are a lot of high-profile Republicans who have to really just bend over backwards to try to endorse him still. And, and if he keeps rubbing people the wrong way, if he keeps saying these controversial things, there are going to be less and less Republican support who, who will back him. And, and Paul Ryan went up in Cleveland on the RNC stage and basically took the pledge for Trump. And for Trump not to return the favor is, is such a slap in the face to these established Republicans who have finally started to come around to the, to the Trump movement. He's going to Terry Casey, a rare moment of speechlessness. <laughs> I was just soaking up all those things. I'm trying to figure out some of those polls cited. I don't know where in Ohio there's been anything recently. But here's a couple cautions. Four years ago, the conventions were not over until early September. Now they were over in late July. We've got three months to go. I hate to break it to you, but mm -hmm. it's a long ways to go. There's going to be a variety of ups and downs. And really, and I maybe said this on an earlier show, the polling by early September is going to be more indicative because we're still in an August low period with the Olympics, vacations, school starting. Uh, where the polls are at and where we're at in early September will tell you something more. Uh, and as a perspective, and I know later we're going to talk more about polls, the Barry Goldwater year in 64, he was behind 36 points. Right now, the latest, which was the Wall Street Journal uh, that came out, I think, this morning, it was 10 points. So we got a long ways to go. And in my prediction, I'll have another thing of a warning and a consumer tip for people later on. Right. The post-convention polls are showing a predictable bump for Democratic nominee Hillary Clinton. The latest CNN ORC poll shows Clinton has widened her lead over Donald Trump by nine percentage points. The same poll had Trump with a three percentage point lead a week prior. But again, we're talking about post-convention bumps. Derek Clay, is this just the usual bump or something different? What do you think? I think it's a usual bump, but I think that um, Hillary's bump is going to sustain herself. It's going to sustain because she's the best candidate. And <clears throat> Donald Trump is living in a fantasy world if he thinks that his campaign is united. Uh, we've seen evidence of that this week with uh, Pence, his vice presidential nom uh, pick, breaking ranks with him on the, the, the Paul Ryan endorsement. Um, you know, the, <clears throat> the, the slap in the face to the, the, uh, the family that, that lost their son in the war. So, you know, the, the, bump is, the bump for Hillary Clinton is normal, but I think that it's going to sustain through, through time, through the hey, campaign. Hey Derek, one of the little factor that was reported this week, Trump got in 64 million 
in Bernie Sanders type small contributions off web asks, which is an interesting development. I don't know whether it's going to continue, but I still say we've got a long, long ways to go and there's going to be lots of twists and turns. Uh, and also, if you went around and asked people in Columbus, what state is Paul Ryan from and where's his district, nobody's worrying about that inside baseball of who's endorsing or not in some Wisconsin no, congressional primary. I, I agree with you on, on that point, that people may not know where Paul Ryan is from, but this is about credibility. And if you don't have credibility and you're running the, the country, the most powerful country in the, in the world, then that's a major concern for voters. And the people who know who Paul Ryan is are the people who would go out and volunteer for somebody like Donald Trump. He needs that that Republican base to go out and knock on doors and make phone calls. And if you keep alienated, alienating high profile people like Paul Ryan, like John Kasich, then you're not going to get that base of support that can go out and campaign for you in a big state like Ohio. But there's a lot of people out there who feel the people running Congress, Democrat, Republican, they're not happy with them because they haven't got certain things done that they feel they ought to get done. So there is a, a mix of being the outsider versus the insider, and some ways not being too close to the insiders isn't all bad to some voters. I'm not saying that wins it, I'm just saying. But Trump needs to unite the party, and he's not showing any, any movement in the direction of uniting the party. I think that time is running short, and if he doesn't become a lot more disciplined than we've seen him to date, he's going to squander his opportunity because, you know, he could still win it. I mean, there's a path for him to win this thing, but he's not seemingly moving in that direction at all. And in, in fact, he seems to be just continually, continuing to step in the mud and you're just not seeing any discipline from him. He's not talking about issues. I mean, there's so many things that came in the news this week that were negative on Hillary Clinton that he could have jumped on. But instead, he was having this week-long argument with the military family and, and talking about not endorsing Paul Ryan. And I think he even brought up the Megyn Kelly um, comments that he made months ago that got, got him into so much trouble then. Because he thinks that what got him through the primary is what's going to get him through the general? I, I mean... He, he doesn't I call too many of us. Sure. I, I think his insults, his lack of knowledge on issues, and his brash delivery are just indicative of what a country needs in a president. I mean, he has done so much irreparable damage to the Republican Party. I don't, I don't know if the Republican Party will ever be the same after this election. But Derek, the good f news for him is Hillary, like in the interview with Chris Wallace on Fox News, where she said the FBI director said, I'm so truthful and honest, and then this wasn't so much, totally Hillary, but the mystery $400 million in cash delivered to Iran. And that's uh, what Trump should be talking about. Right. That's all Trump should be talking yep. about. He should be getting off these controversial comments. But sometimes you get the sense he's more about, he thinks he gets more traction when he's more of an entertainer. He says these kind of outrageous things that kind of fire up his base. And you see, I, I think that maybe is his tactic. I'm, I, I don't know, but it seems to be that's, that's kind of his, his way to go. And I'd agree with Kathy. Discipline in politics is very important because sometimes on a TV show or a product, if you get five or eight percent of the audience, you can become very wealthy with that. But in politics, you got to get to 51 percent. Two other polls out this week focused on the battleground states of New Hampshire and Pennsylvania. They show Clinton with double-digit leads over Trump. I'm not sure what Trump was talking about in that for previous uh, 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 clip. Uh, so uh, double-digit leads in, in these in these in these other states um, like New Hampshire, like Pennsylvania. He's really counting on those states. Well, you've also got to look at, and that's another thing why in early September, when I see polls like yes, the Wall Street Journal, I want to look internally at what kind of sample, of where are the cross tabs, where's the enthusiasm level, and the Quinnipiac is usually one of the better ones for Ohio because they have all those details. So we've still got a long ways to go. Again, three months is an eternity in politics because we've seen in primaries and other elections where the debates something happens here, something happens there internationally or in America can make a but, big difference. You know, important to note, New Hampshire is a small state. Pennsylvania is a key swing state in right. this election, and Trump really thought that that was a state he could be a player in. And to be down double digits 
is is probably not what they were expecting. I mean, I expect the race will be closer in Ohio. Which really makes you wonder what's going on in Ohio, because Ohio is still that one swing state that's still so close. How is how is Hillary Clinton getting so much separation between her and Trump in these other states like Pennsylvania, but Ohio? There's still something that Trump is saying that's connecting with a with a big big portion of voters here, and, and I wonder what it is, but it's still something that's resonating here well, in Ohio. Part of it also, when you look internally at the polling data. Obama doesn't do as well in Ohio as he does in some other states. So Hillary has chosen but to he kind won of the state twice. Obama did? Yes. Well, but he still got problems when you look at and also you look at the 14 and the 10 data Obama got didn't do very well here. So uh, it's still a ways to go. Part of that you also got to give credit to Romney was not the best candidate. As he ran and Trump in Trump is a better candidate than Romney. I was. didn't say that. We'll have to see. <laughs> but but Romney, part of it was Obama's win, and also Obama did a better job of energizing younger people. I don't know whether Hillary can do that yet. I expect Hillary. I, I would think that her campaign would try and put Bill Clinton into the state as much as possible because of his popularity here. But we haven't. I haven't really seen that he hasn't. I mean, she was obviously here right after the convention, but I would expect to start start seeing uh, her husband around. Republican Ohio Senator Rob Portman has snagged a handful of labor endorsements that include the Ohio Teamsters, the Fraternal Order of Police of Ohio, and the United Mine Workers of America. And the Koch brothers have turned their sights and their money uh, toward Portman's race against challenger and former Ohio Governor Democrat Ted Strickland. None of this bodes well for Strickland, who is behind in fundraising as well. Terry Casey, how much does this depend on the top of the ticket at this point? We were just talking about that when it comes to a critical Senate seat like this, or are all these other factors going to uh, take over? Well, what Democrats tell me is Strickland's based his whole campaign on hoping Hillary wins big and he rides her coattails in or skirt tails or pantsuit tails, whatever it is. Uh, I'm not sure that's the best strategy. And some of the people chided this past week Ted Strickland because he celebrated his 75th birthday. And I know lots of energetic people in their 70s, but Ted has not been very active out campaigning. Well, okay, I was going to say, I don't know what he looks like because we're hardly seeing him at all. Derek, I mean, where where's Ted Strickland? Ted Strickland is talking to voters every single day. He where? may, he may not he may not be at the, uh, the Ohio State Fair. He may not be walking parades, but I can tell you that he's talking with voters. But here's Why a man who it? needs free, he needs free, uh, <laughs> he needs a lot more free publicity. He doesn't have enough money to spend on paid Paid you, had, you had a huge group of unions come out to say, hey, I know that four unions have come out for Portman, but there are five, ten unions that are all for Strickland, and here we are supporting him, but Strickland wasn't there. He, he took a phone call later, but why wasn't he there? Why wasn't he at the event? Portman's going around the state fair. He's doing Pelotonia. Yeah. He's doing these things. Where's Strickland? I don't know. It's, it's, a, Derek, contrast. Yeah. it's a real contrast because Portman's got events every day that they're trying to get us to come out and cover. Yeah. I mean, more events than we even care to hear about. Um, but we're just not getting to hearing anything from Strickland, which is just very unusual why he wouldn't it's, want the publicity. And Derek, this is a state of 11 and a half million people. I mean, the media likes to cover people, and if you're hiding from the media and hiding from the voters and people can't find you, it raises questions. What I don't understand, too, is this is supposed to be a close race. This is supposed to be a competitive race, so it doesn't seem like from the level of activity we're seeing that it's a competitive race at all, although I know it's going to be closer than that would suggest, but you just wonder yeah. what's going on. Now, there, there is an argument for, you know, the top of the ticket. I'm not saying that that's the, uh, the ex-governor's strategy, but if Hillary does well in the state of Ohio, obviously former Governor Strickland is going to do well. I can't, I can't speak for his campaign. I don't know what <laughs> events that he is or not going to, but I do know that the, the governor is out talking to voters every day. And I think this, this election is just so strange, so unique that I don't know if the top of the ticket thing is really going to impact this Senate race as much as we think it might. Uh, I, it, it, to begin with, when we heard that Trump, when we knew Trump was going to be the nominee, we instantly thought, oh, well, mate, this is probably going to hurt Portman and help Strickland. But now, who knows, because it's just such an odd race that Portman's it's not predictable. He's, he's going to have a lot of money. He's going to have more money than anybody. And, and just this week, wasn't the former President Bush in to yeah. campaign for him? He's getting a lot. George Kasich, w., right? George W. Kasich's campaigning for him. He's getting a lot of support from some 
influential Republicans, I think, that Ohio voters will, you know, be interested to hear from. And Ted Strickland's got, unfortunately for him, his record as governor in terms of the unemployment. You take the rainy day fund down to, was it 89 cents? Like yeah, I, I mean, under less than a dollar. Cents. Those are yeah. things that come back and haunt you. I'm going to tell you what, 89 cents, you're correct. It was 89 cents. Okay that was left in the rainy day fund. But he used that money for exactly what it was intended to do. We had a rainy day. We were in the midst of the worst recession of our time, and he used that money so he didn't have to lay off people uh, at the state of Ohio. So I don't fault him for using the rainy day fund in a rainy day situation. But there were layoffs and there were furloughs. Talk to state employees. They remember when they got the furloughs, which is like a pay cut, and they weren't happy about it. It hurt them that time, and it hurt them in their pension. We definitely governed in a bad economy, that's for sure. Yeah, or bad management or some combination. Or something. <laughs> this week, a Franklin County judge ordered the Electronic Classroom of Tomorrow, or ECOT, to hand over student attendance login records. The court mandate comes amid ongoing concerns about the e-school's dropout rate and funding. State education officials are trying to decide if the $108 million it paid ECOT last school year was worth it. Kathy Kandiski, ECOT's refused to provide login and logout records now that we have some semblance of data available uh, apparently later, late ECOT Friday afternoon. Yeah, they delivered about 25,000 documents, about 50 boxes, bankers boxes I'm told. I guess that's a box used that's by a fancy bankers. names. It's fancy. It's a it's a probably box. has a cool lid. Yeah. <laughs> We're delivered to the Department of Education. ECOT says they have now complied with the judge's order and provided the information that the Department of Education sought so they would be able to do their attendance audit. The Department of Education has not yet told me whether or not they think ECOT has provided the pertinent information, but I'm sure we'll hear whether they think so or not. This is really important information. There's a lot of money at stake, which is really all you need to know. If, if the department determines that ECOT's attendance is not as high as they suggest, I think it's about 17,000 students is what they report, and they find that really all those kids aren't really participating in classes, the information they sought was log in, log out data just so they could see how much work the students were doing online. If they determine that not as many students attend the school, well then they'll adjust ECOT's attendance accordingly and that will cost the school money because the state pays per pupil in state funding. And we're talking $108 million. That's, that's, a lot. that's how much the ECOT was supposed to get from the state depending on how this audit goes. And $108 million, we've seen a lot of other schools or a couple of other schools lose a lot of money because mm -hmm. their attendance wasn't what they thought yeah. it was. Right. Now would they have to be in a situation where they would have to repay some money, some of yes. the money back? Yes, and apparently that's happened in the past where schools have been overpaid and they have to return money to the state. But of course, ECOT is, you know, they're, they've been running television ads and all saying that if they have to return all this, this money, and they're not saying how much or anything, but if they have to return a big chunk of money, that this could force, this could jeopardize their business contracts and could force the school to close. That's what they're saying. So they've got parents riled up now and also kind of lobbying the Department of Education to keep the doors open. You know, the, the issue is tax dollars. And I think all taxpayers want to make sure that their tax dollars are being appropriately spent. So the issue is, is, is the state overpaying ECOT? That's what they're trying to figure out. And I and think ECOT. whether it's public schools, private schools, these kind of electronic schools, having some accountability and checking the records, the difficulty is what's there and how do you measure? Is it just kids being there or being logged on or did they actually have to do some activity? How do you measure that? You know, with a traditional brick and mortar school, the student goes to the school, the student sits in a seat, the student, you know, talks to a teacher and the student goes home. So it's easy to, easy to gauge attendance. At, at the online schools, the question is, do you gauge attendance by how long they're logged on to a computer? Do you gauge it, you know, ECOT's arguing, well, they also do a lot of offline work and they have their teachers certify the, the work that the, their students do offline as well. So how do all these things factor in to determine online attendance? It's not, it's difficult. And on that teacher certification, there's a phrase that says providing educational opportunity. And it's found in the revised code. It's found in different handbooks. Oh, and just providing educational opportunity. We might see a court battle where ECOT argues that as long as they provided an opportunity, then they should get the money. It, and people are comparing it to, well, if you're a brick and mortar school, 
Can you just open the door? Can you let a student sit on in a desk and provide a teacher? And if that if that student wants even, to learn, not even walk in the door. We offered yeah. we we offered the classes. They chose not to come. We should still get right. paid. I think we're going to see this the fight target. about the the phrase educational opportunity. Right, and and that's that's part of the issue. I, I think that you know charter schools need to be on the same level playing level field as regular traditional schools. If you're getting money from the state of Ohio, there should be a level of transparency that goes along with that. It's accountability. I mean, I, I don't think anybody's trying to really shut down online schools. I think that there's enough success stories with online students that people, people see the value in online schools for certain students. Um, the question is, how do you pay them? Okay, time for our final off the record parting shots. Derek Clay. You know, it's great that we got the Smart Cities grant, uh, but I would love to see that grant go a little further and include light rail. Personally, I would love to see a full-fledged subway system. We're a big city now. We need to act like it. Andy Chow. Donald Trump's campaign is trying to reach out to the state of Ohio through new staffers to really expand its campaign. Uh, it, that includes hiring some new people, including Treasurer Josh Mandel's communications director, Seth Unger. So we'll see how that works out. Terry Casey. Well, in the next three months, you might think at home your best friend is your cat or dog, spouse or children. But in the next three months, the most important thing is holding on to that remote control and knowing where the mute button is because the TV airwaves <laughs> are going to be so bad, so polluted. What? Just in the Senate race, it's over $90 million. So learn how to use your mute and operate it well. Kathy well, I'm just going to say, I'm following up on the ECOT stuff, I mean, this is nothing that's going to be settled quickly. This is going to be a long, drawn-out court case, and it'll be interesting to see this 2003 agreement that ECOT's kind of hanging their hat on, whether that still, still holds true. And touted as ground zero for the Trump campaign in Southeast Ohio, a new campaign office opened this week. The problem is it's not affiliated with the Trump campaign. And this speaks to the campaign's greater issues in Ohio, a crucial swing state in a typical election year. But maybe that doesn't matter anymore. That's Columbus on the Record for this week. Please check us out online. We're on Facebook and Twitter, and you can connect all of that on our website at WOSU.org. I'm Ann Fisher. Have a good week.